All right. So I think we have a, a, a more than a good quorum at 330, uh, 330 people. So, um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna kick us off and get us going this morning. Um, we're very excited to to be hosting uh, Get Going with E-commerce, uh, brought to you by Republic Bank this morning. Um, we are going to share. Um, you know, a range of tips around, you know, getting started with e-commerce if you're just thinking about uh, moving forward um, or if you've been in the e-commerce space and you want to refine and sharpen and, and get going, uh, there'll be great content for you um, in this area as well. And we're also going to talk a little bit about pitfalls to avoid and so on. And, you know, we're, 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 we're doing this webinar um, you know, largely against uh, a very interesting um, backdrop of time, right? Uh, we are all as individuals, businesses, leaders, etc., cetera, um, navigating through this coronavirus pandemic. Um, and, and I think a, a reason why there have been so many people who are interested in this webinar and interested in this topic is because it's really forcing us to look at this journey ahead. Um, there are lots of things that, that we all have to navigate to, to come out of this on the other side, but we also want to make sure that we have a, you know, an upbeat tone because while it is a challenging time um, and it does feel like the stakes are very high, um, you know, this is, a, this is something that we believe that can be navigated. And, and this session and this webinar is, is one of an initial series of two that's designed to bring together some information and some content that can help um, you know, regional uh, leaders, SMEs, all the way to larger companies, as well as any professional, you know, learn some things that can help them navigate. Uh, one of the things that we're really excited about is that this uh, webinar, which has had, uh, you know, a very, very large number, over hundreds of people um, sign up for it. And we've had people sign up from all over. I mean, I'm looking at the chat. I see a good morning from New York. I'm seeing good mornings from Guyana. So in addition to um, you know, people in, in Trinidad and Tobago, um, you know, we're seeing a real interest in these topics from all around. So, so we're really excited and, and glad to have everybody this morning, right? Um, so now I'm going to kind of make my way into some introductions. Uh, so uh, we have a really exciting group today. Um, you know, the group has been put together really to, to, to get a bunch of diverse perspectives together for, for all of our listeners out there. Um, so you can really get a feel for people who have been attacking this either for a really long time, um, you know, more recently, uh, who, are, who are approaching uh, some of these challenges in different ways or have a, a variety of different perspectives that we think will be important as you move forward, right? Um, so first, by way of introduction, uh, I am Chike Farrell. I am your host. Um, uh, I have, um, I guess, the 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 interesting scenario of straddling a couple different worlds simultaneously, as some of us do. Um, so I live in the United States right now. Um, I run global marketing for a cloud software company, but I also co-own uh, Caribbean Ideas, a Caribbean Ideas Synapse, um, which is a, an, an advertising agency based in Trinidad and Tobago that really focuses on integrated marketing and content and storytelling. So you know, across the journey. Um, you know, have gotten the opportunity to see lots of different businesses and how they're handling, um, you know, navigating digital and digital technology. We worked with a number of clients in terms of the e-commerce space. Um, and so we're really interested to, to get into some of that conversation with the panelists that we have today, um, you know, particularly at this time, right? Uh, but it's not really about me. I want to kind of switch to our exciting um, exciting panelists. So first of all, um, I'm going to introduce Catherine Nurse. Um, you know, Catherine uh, uh, is, uh, we'll call her the quintessential immortal beauty. Um, you know, but she is really extremely passionate about cosmetics and makeup products. I had the um, pleasure of interviewing Catherine for um, uh, a podcast that we recently started, the Uptick podcast, and I really found her to be um, really, really knowledgeable, really, really engaging. So, so Catherine is trained in the USA. Um, you know, at a cosmetic research and development laboratory for, for a number of years. Um, and she really used this to channel her obsession, her obsession to, to create a career as a cosmetic chemist. Um, she, she eventually decided to return home to Trinidad and Tobago to create Immortal Beauty. Um, and, and, and her company is really focused on, you know, she will call it 
kind of creating a little local luxury. Um, she really wants to offer the Caribbean lifestyle to women uh, all over the world through beauty. So she uses that training um, in fashion management, brand management, the fascination with travel, et cetera. And she brings those together in her products. Um, and she's been in the e-commerce space from, from you know, almost essentially the very beginning of her business. Uh, so we're really excited to have Catherine. And Catherine, welcome. Um, I want to invite you to, to share that sort of one key thought or key area that you're interested in really diving into a little bit deeper as we as we go into the day. So my one thing that I would really love to discuss and to explore more today is um, how little you really need to start and really delve into the e-commerce space. Um, a lot of people think that it needs, you need a lot in order to start of resources of all sorts of different types. And um, I'm proof that that's not true. <laughs> so, Great. Yeah. Awesome. Great. All right. So, so next up we have Alex Yuchong. So, so Alex is um, someone that uh, that, I, that I go back with a lot of years because we both went to the same um, high school in in Trinidad. Uh, so, Alex is a chartered accountant by profession. Um, he has over twenty years of uh, of expertise and knowledge of leading uh, international retail practices and now running a, a, a major retail enterprise in the Caribbean. Um, he has experience that spans enterprise risk, management and governance, uh, operational audit, process optimization, as well as financial modeling, marketing and analytics. Um, and he's acquired that, you know, working across a bunch of different roles uh, in notable firms in Canada. Uh, he studied in Canada and then continued to work in Canada. Um, so he's worked at KPMG. He's worked with Canadian grocery retailer Sobeats. Um, he uh, returned to Trinidad and Tobago um, in the mid uh, 2000 or about 2013, 14, Alex. Is that right? Oh, I think you might be muted. Let's see. I didn't, I didn't hear you. Say, say, can you say again, Alex? Uh, 2012. 2012. Okay, great. Um, so we turned to Trinidad to, to, to build and take the excellent group of companies to a whole new level. Uh, in 2019, he was appointed CEO of the group of companies and has been really, um, you know, aggressively changing and evolving the company. And he is spearheaded, among other things. Um, the companies move into into e-commerce and he also serves as the group's compliance officer as well. Uh, so, Alex, what's your one key thought that you're interested in sharing today or diving well, into it? I think one of the biggest things is that everybody's jumping on the bandwagon for e-commerce and digital payments and that, you know, this new space that we're in. Um, the one thing that I would like to share is that, you know, don't bite off too much that you can chew. You'll have to start off slow, start off small. Um, we, we've been through many different uh, uh, challenges throughout the eight years that we've been in the e-commerce business, right? So by starting small, you can get your processes, you can get your customer experience, right? And if you try to do too much at the same time, it will become overwhelming. Great. Awesome. And I know we will definitely dive into, into some of your experience. Uh, so then up next, um, you know, another great uh, perspective is going to come from Denise Ramnarine, um, who's going to bring sort of amazing experience across a career that's spanned over 20 years at Republic Bank in roles that have you know, range from in the communications organization to the information technology and IT division. Um, within the IT division, she's worked on business transformation. She's worked on technological advancement of the bank. Uh, she's also done application and technology delivery. So she's currently the executive in charge of electronic channels and payments. Um, and so she's going to bring some really interesting perspective. I'd say that Denise, you're going to have a, a really interesting bird's eye view looking across large numbers of businesses that you've seen come to the bank um, who've been wanting to adopt and adapt new technologies and to facilitate our, our range of their goals. So, so Denise, inviting you to share kind of one of the areas that you're interested in diving into today. Yes, th thanks, GK. Well, I'm really excited to see so many people from all over the Caribbean who joined us this morning. Welcome, everyone. Um, I know lots of people are, have some anxiety about what e-commerce means for them, especially at this time. So I'm really looking forward to sharing, yes, about payments, but um, having the discussion about what e-commerce means and being, going online means in a more broader perspective than just the payments, because there, there are a lot of other facets to it. And I am hoping that we can share some of that so people, persons can understand, take it on board and 
uh, use that to plan their way forward. Lovely, awesome, great. All right, and then uh, and then next we have Carolyn Taylor um, of uh, of Media and Editorial Projects or MEP Publishers for short, um, and and Kat, and Carolyn is also uh, very passionate about telling impactful stories. Uh, she's been able to do that and been grateful to do that in print, online media, but also theater, music, film, and television for over twenty years. Um, you know, she's worked in all of those areas, in film and TV and, uh, and performance arts as actor, singer, director, producer, which just makes me um, tired just thinking about it, Carolyn. Um, but she also does a lot of other freelance work, um, volunteer work for causes and organizations that she's passionate about. So she's, she's, uh, she's won a, a Commonwealth scholarship, international scholar. You, have a BA in performance studies from Williams College in Massachusetts and an MA in performance and theater from University of London. Um, but as if that wasn't enough, um, you know, uh, she is also a staff writer, uh, web editor for Caribbean Beat magazine. So MEP publishers, um, they produce Caribbean Beat, they produce Discover TNT, um, they uh, produce Park Heights Sports Magazine, as well as a range of books. Um, and so she'll also bring us a really interesting perspective because, you know, and as you will learn, they jumped into uh, the digital channels very aggressively quite early on um, and have been using digital commerce and e-commerce to sell to, um, to people all over the world. So, um, so Carolyn, again, welcome to you and, and let's, let's hear your kind of key area that you're interested in diving into today. Um, I think for me that would have to be um, determining exactly what the, the, the customer needs, wants, and feel, feels comfortable doing. So trying to, to kind of um, make, make all your products and services available to them in the way that is easiest for them to access. Um, so that, that's not the area I'm most important. Okay. Lovely. Awesome. Okay, great. So, you know, so, so we're going to get started, get into the conversation. Um, you know, in terms of flow, folks, you know, we're going to frame things up a little bit, um, you know, with some, with, some, with some thoughts that we've sort of put together from our various conversations. But really today is, as we said, it's all about e-commerce, digital commerce, how to get started, um, you know, what are some tips and tricks that you can learn from our, from our panelists. Um, as well as some of the things that you can avoid. We, you know, a big part of the objective today is to, to help save you <clears throat> time and help you skip steps that you don't necessarily need to, to take because other people have taken them before you. So kind of the, 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 the essence of good collaboration and passing along learnings. So really excited to bring these different perspectives together. Um, and I think a good place to start is just to sort of frame up the conversation as we go along I'll certainly um, drive the conversation, talk about different things, dive into a bunch of different areas. I'll be keeping an eye on the on the chat. Um, so, so when we see questions that, that we want to include um, and that makes sense, we'll certainly include them. So, so you you can feel free to um, you know start putting some of those things in. Um, and one of the things I'm also going to do just before we get started is I'm going to let's, let's let's make this thing a little bit of, a little bit interactive. So, okay, so we have. Um, uh, we, we launched a couple of polls, and so we have a live poll going right now um, that asks, coming into this webinar, how aware are you of what is, what is required to set up an e-commerce, um, you know, set up or e-commerce for your business? Um, you know, about 35% of you say, hey, I have a little knowledge. 28% um, uh, are saying, help, you know, I don't know where to start. Um, you know, 23% of you say, I have a fair idea, so you might be looking for some for some sharp money. Um, and 12% of you say, hey, you know, you, you know a lot about each other. You just really want, you know, you're looking for a couple of different things. And I see we're up to 500, over 500 um, attendees now. So a good place to start in terms of framing this thing up is to, <clears throat> let's look at some of the big pillars of, of e-commerce and some of the common questions that our panelists had when they were starting out, as well as common things that certainly you know, I have seen and, and others have seen in, in in working with a bunch of different a bunch of different clients. So to really have sort of five big pillars that we're going to group things into, and we're going to have a lot of conversation within these areas. Um, so even though this is not necessarily where many people start, I think as as we as we show the additional pillars, you'll find that that sometimes people hone in on other things first. But one of the most important things is, okay, if you have an e-commerce presence, if you have that digital storefront, 
Um, you know, you really need to start thinking about how will you get customers to that storefront? Um, who are you targeting and, and who are you doing it for? What segments, what countries are you trying to cross over into other regional territories? Are you trying to focus primarily on um, customers in your in your country? Are you looking to go international? So that's usually a very important one with a range of different things that, that spin out of that. Um, I think the other big one is really the experience, actual experience of purchasing from you digitally. Um, so people are typically thinking about, well, where am I going to sell? Am I going to have my own web uh, store? Am I going to use Facebook or social media? Uh, one of the things that I think has been really interesting about, uh, you know, how businesses have been adapting is the rise of of WhatsApp web order clicking and when people will fulfill it and get the payment offline afterwards separately. Um, and the next webinar that's coming up in this series is really all about the low touch economy and how businesses are and will continue to adapt there to so we'll dive into that even further. Uh, but the customer experience and the web uh, and the web area is one of the big is one of the big things. Um, uh, then the next one is payments, obviously one of the biggest ones, right? How do how do my customers pay me today? Um, what's the makeup, the credit card people, or the cash people, or the debit card people, et cetera. How do I enable payments? This is one of the areas that is that is usually, um, you know, kind of the most cloudy and people want the most, uh, you know, most insights into. Um, the next one is, is, is site merchandising. And in fact, um, you know, my wife has worked in e-commerce for many, many years. She's worked for Amazon and William Sonoma and multiple companies um, earlier in her career. And, uh, and, and and her role in, in larger e-commerce operations was, was actually the site merchandiser. So, so, so when you get really deep into e-commerce, you then start to, have to think a little bit about how am I going to showcase these products and services digitally and online. Um, and certainly in the consumer goods space, a lot of time, Catherine will talk to that, um, a lot of time and thought goes into how you showcase your products in the right way to get people to want to click buy and go through that process. That's another big, big pillar and big, big key area. And then last but certainly not least is logistics. Um, because being in the e-commerce space creates a range of, um, a, a range of knock on impacts, if you will, uh, in terms of customer service, response, returns, delivery, and a whole range of different things that kind of, you know, expand out of that. And as I look at our real-time poll, 57% um, of you have said that, you know, that figuring out how to transact digitally is the thing that you're uh, interested in. 20% uh, of you have said, hey, you're, you're interested in, uh, in the storefront e-commerce experience space. 12% of you are interested in acquisition. 5% in merchandising and 3% in logistics and delivery. So that gives us a sense of, where the energy is, um, and our panelists, I'm sure, will, uh, will will take note of that, and and we will go and we will go forward. So so really interesting, and actually the experience is kind of popping up and popping back in in real time. But we have a good sense of where things are. Um, I think the 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 last thing that we will share, doing some reading, and um, I'm gonna kind of share a, uh, a a little bit of a theory with with all of with all of you out there, um, which is really as you think about, you know, why you're jumping into this, when you're thinking about, you know, where we are and where we're going to go. Um, you know, I, I've been sharing with clients a lot that, you know, one, we've been seeing a lot of terms used over and over again, unprecedented times and the new normal and other things. And, and, and I've been kind of putting forward to folks that, you know, if you think about travel after 9-11, for example, you know, it is now sort of accepted by all of us as we travel that we're going to go through security and take off our shoes and go through this and go through that. And it's just accepted. That, to me, that's the true definition of normal. A lot of what we have been working through in these past few days and weeks and months has been series of adjustments and adaptations. We kind of had this initial shock of, um, you know, going into remote work and, you know, self-quarantining and, and, and as, as, as leaders and business owners, you have to think about how are your customers feeling and what are the implications for you? And there were implications, there were implications for messaging and, um, and for some brands there were, you know, there was a sale bump, um, but there were major shockwaves for other brands depending on what sector you were in. Um, and then you kind of, we sort of move into this transition phase. 
Um, and, and we have to think about, and, and I think all of the people who are on this webinar are thinking about this phase and this initial set of transitions. But we think that this transition actually goes on for a while. There may be more shocks to come. Um, there may be some knock-on impacts. And you know, even as people start to accept this world and this reality, um, you know, for businesses and business leaders, and I think that's why a lot of you are 500 a year here, is it means that we need to experiment rapidly. You know, we need to adapt or, or we might get left behind. And that's, and that's what we need to, to are thinking through. Um, but I had had this idea that, you know, it's really when people accept that the way things are, whether that means that, you know, restaurants are, you know, they're just changed permanently in terms of how they allocate space or lines or, you know, what are those things that will form you know, the real, as I was calling it, the new normal, but then I found that McKinsey um, online has a similar idea and they're calling it the next normal. And really, as we as we get into the discussion, I want to kind of put to you all, you know, to really think about, you know, a lot of, of, of us are obviously contending with, with stuff that we've never seen before, um, but, but pushing ourselves to think about what that next normal will be. What are the things that will be left after people have gotten accustomed to remote work and companies may decide, well, you know what, maybe I don't need all of that office space or, or what are those things that you're going to have to take on board? How do you adapt your strategy? These are some of the things that, um, that, we, will, that we will be thinking about and that today's conversation is designed to get at, right? So, oh, just seeing, just looking at the chat for some questions. Um, so I'm going to come back. I'm, now I'm just going to leave it on this um, framework view as we start getting into the conversation. And what I want to do is, Catherine, I'm going to start with you. Um, you know, that that motivation for getting going with with uh, e-commerce is one of those those important things that a lot of the folks who are on here have. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, as you, you shared with us, um, that for you in your business, you just sort of saw it as one and the same from the very outset. So can you talk a little bit about that and kind of how you've been applying, um, you know, using e-commerce to sell? So when I started, when I, well, I should say restarted my business in 2014, but I started in 2011, I've always been an online shopper. Um, I'm a consummate consumer. And so it was just um, natural for me that I would have to have e-commerce on my website when I started my business too. I really couldn't see any other um, way to do it, particularly because we didn't have the investments in, in um, brick and mortar until very... In much, much later in my career, until last year actually. So um, while I was distributing, I also needed an option for people to come and get the product directly from me. And so e-commerce to me was just a natural step. Chike, we're not, wait, are you on oh, mute? Sorry, I was, I was on mute, yeah. No, and I'm seeing some questions. So just so you guys know, I'm seeing the questions about if we can move the speaker tiles i don't think we can move the speaker tiles but there isn't going to be another view that is going to show you um text down at down that low so just so you know um so great so thank you um catherine for kind of sharing that so caroline i also want to kind of switch to you um you know you jumped into the digital space really really early can you talk a little bit about that first just going online and then starting to to figure out sales what was driving you online initially Sure. So um, MEP was founded in 1990, and the first publication that we brought out was Discover Trinidad and Tobago, and probably the, the following year um, in 1992. Um, and by about 1997, um, there was, it, you know, the, the, the web was just kind of um, uh, becoming something that, that more and more people were accessing. And um, someone actually saw the, the website and, and about well, not the website, the, the publication and said, you know, this should really go online. And we said, okay, let's give it a try. So Discover Trinidad and Tobago went online first and then we, we took Caribbean Beach online afterward. Um, so the, 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 the idea behind that really was are there additional people who can access the content and the magazines who may not be able to access it readily? as this in print, you know, they, they may not be able to get a copy from a consulate or from a tour guide or um, come to our office because if they're overseas, they may not be able to, to access it or they may not be traveling regularly or know somebody who's traveling to pick up a Caribbean piece on the plane. So we thought the um, the websites were excellent ways for people to be able to access the content 
as we produce in the magazines and for free because all of our all of our content is is essentially distributed for free, you know, paywalls, nothing like that. Um, but there were still people that wanted to access print copies. And um, by the early 2000s, when I was coming, well, mid 2000s, when I was coming back from, from studying and, and working in US, um, I had the expectation too of being able to um, subscribe to things online, buy things online, and have them delivered to me without too much friction. Um, and at that point, we had people who, you know, would, would, would cut the little subscription form out of Caribbean Beats and mail it back in and then send their check and then we process it and mail it out. So we said, all right, there's still some people that like to do that, eh, even in 2020. But we said that, you know, it, it really was a situation where it should be easy for people to just subscribe online, manage their subscription online and have it delivered to them much faster. Um, especially if they had credit cards and, and could just process the payment. So that was what kind of prompted us to, to move to offering a digital payment option for subscriptions and for individual magazine orders like for Discover TNT or um, we also have a book in print. So we had various books that were available in um, local bookstores and some regional and diaspora bookstores. But because of the difficulty of actually shipping books in large quantities to bookstores overseas, it was actually easier for us to, to kind of fulfill orders from our website individually than, than mail them in bulk to, to distributors overseas. So that those are the things that kind of drove us to, to make um, our products available um, so that people could, could purchase it online and have it delivered to them wherever they were in the world. Great. Um, and then Alex, I want to come to you. Um, so as I understand, you know, you, you at Excellent Stores have been you know, at the e-commerce game since about 2014, uh, give or take, give or take a year. Um, and you can add a different objective. So so for, you know, for Catherine and Carolyn, part of the impetus was, um, you know, people in, in, in geographies further away, whereas for you, it was a little bit different, um, a little bit more focused on, on the home front. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. So Excellent Stores is a, is, a, is a department store and we've been in business for 62 years. Uh, but as you said, you know, we've got into the e-commerce business in 2013, which we eventually launched our e-commerce platform in 2014. So we were one of the first bricks and mortar retailers in Trinidad uh, to launch a local online shopping with home delivery. But let me take a step back and the genesis of that pivot in the business model was really as a result of what we were seeing happening in the local economy as well as the global economy. See, our markets and most people across the Caribbean would see this now is that our markets are no longer defined by our geographical boundaries. You see Amazon and online shopping on foreign websites growing exponentially. We see an increase in local traffic congestion, right? And more importantly, you're starting to see that there's a shift in demographics where Generation X and the millennial shoppers, which will now make up all of our future shoppers, they're now starting to opt to shop on foreign online sites rather than to fight up in traffic and go from store to store to store. Because for them, the most important thing is about speed and convenience because they just don't have the time. So once you understand, once we started to understand what the customer demographic and the needs were, we had to change. And then on a global, on a more, a bigger perspective, the central bank at one point had estimated that 500 million US dollars leaves Trinidad and Tobago annually to pay for credit card payments. Annually, 500 million US dollars. And you know, in, we're in a foreign exchange crisis and that has to change, right? So getting into the e-commerce business was our first attempt at normalizing local online shopping. So the challenges is not necessarily that, you know, we're seeing, you know, people go online, but as a country as a whole and countries across the Caribbean as well, that you're starting to see we're not only just losing market share, right, personally as one business, but the entire retail sector and industry is losing market share because of this foreign online site, foreign, foreign online shopping and the leakage. So that's why we all needed to start normalizing local online shopping by combining the virtual world with the physical world. So... And we've been doing that now for about, and we're into our eighth year going on. Great, awesome. Um, and Denise, we're gonna to come to you in a second, but just so everyone knows, I just took a little quick screenshot. I saw, I saw a question just saying, hey, can you, uh, can I show you the results of the real-time poll? 
So, so it, I, I kind of put the, the quick screenshot up on screen so you could so you could all see what what people are most interested in. Um, you know, th there are a bunch of questions that have come in a little bit of, around you know the, the experience and setting up this store and so on. Uh, even though there's the majority of the interest, there's a lot of interest in payments. We'll come to that in a second. But I want to kind of come come back to to the experience in the storefront and so on. Each of um, had to go in there and build and, you know, go on, you're all along the spectrum from, you know, developers and integrations and, and all sorts of things to, to doing it yourself. So we'll come back and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Denise, I'm going to kind of come to you because, you know, as, as I said before, I think one of the really interesting, um, you know, pieces that you play in today is a view, as I say, kind of the, the, the 20,000 foot view birds i view across a large number of of leaders and uh, lots of people who have different motivations for for getting going with with e-commerce so so you've heard what each of the panelists said um you know how does that map to what you've seen in terms of the motivation from your um customers kind of over the past few years and even the last couple of months um you know are there other things that are spurring people into e-commerce e and do you think that's a, a trend that's going to continue yeah, Chiki. So, in the last couple of months, or in the last month especially, a lot of more persons have become interested in going online because their business is changing. They can't serve their customers the traditional ways. People can't come into their stores. So, they everyone is fighting up to find a way to keep their business alive. How do they change their operations to mm -hmm. make this thing work and sustain their business, keep right. the cash flows going? Um, so obviously a lot more people are interested. Um, our experience with e-commerce, I mean, started a few years ago and then we had started with one product that, you know, was, was like a plugin that you had to do for the payments and you had to have a website and, you know, persons who had already had a website would have, that would have been fairly easy. And the larger companies who had capabilities for development or could easily outsource that, that was great. But for smaller merchants, um, they needed a more nimble solution and something more agile. So in recognizing that, we had to broaden our offering um, to provide something for the smaller merchants who might not even want a whole website. They just, as you were talking about before, you were talking about you know, they just want a way to get the payment easily if it is just via um, an invoicing button to send a quote and get the payment back quickly in a messaging platform or via Facebook or WhatsApp. So we had to go and find something to bring that to the consumers. And so we have that now. And I think the sign up is very quick as well. I think within four days, you can turn that around. And it re ranges from, you know, doing those simple invoicing and payment buttons right up to the website development. Uh, and I think that will really help. And we've seen a lot of response to that. And people are really interested in, in getting out and signing on for it. And we even had to change the way we do signups. I mean, for um, just like businesses are changing how they do operations, we have had to change how we do our operations too. Um, our sign up for our online banking and stuff for the retail side is, is um, had to be contactless. We've had to change that for the corporate side. We're changing that as well. Um, and for this payment facility, for the um, e-commerce facility, that is contactless as well. So right. sending in whatever documents and the sign up has necessarily had to be contactless. Um, Got it. There so, is. So I wanted to dive in there a little bit because it kind of fits with some of the questions around and I'm seeing some of your questions, folks, and we're going we're gonna to touch on some of the questions that have been coming in the the chat. So, because actually that, it, it, it all kind of comes together a little bit, right? So, um, so Denise, you talked just now and you talked with me separately as we kind of prepared for this um, about how you've had to change your offering to just to help people, you know, along a spectrum of the ways that they need to enable receiving payments and just kind of creating an e-commerce experience right and you've shared that 
you know, there are sort of you're facilitating larger integrations, but also some people might just need a button to, to be able to get in the game. Can you expand a little bit about that? Because I, I see questions where people are interested in, okay, well, what are the different choices that are available to us and, and, and how does the bank maybe help with that? And I'll kind of come back to the other panelists about some of the solutions that you guys have used. Uh, okay, so there, there are a range of options and I would, I mean, I could, we could provide a lot more detail, of sure. course, but the, essentially, the, at the very basic, it starts with those invoicing and payment buttons, and I think that is at a cost of like um, 20 US a month, something like that, and it goes up from there as you want more. If you want to build, if you want to have a, a presence on a, like a mall shop, an online mall shop, you know, it, you can a little more and be able to visually show your products and let persons click and select and then generate the invoices or if you wanted to go as far as having a website and generating an entire website um, we've made, even made that that simpler as well so you have an option where you can run through and and click through developing your your website and your platform and do that or you can even go further and we can link you to someone who can help you develop your own bespoke website. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, so I'll kind of build on that, you know, Catherine, you you uh, talked a little bit about the the area that you, one of the areas you wanted to, you know, make sure that people understood is that, look, you know, there is going and getting developers and going big, um, but, you know, you're not a developer, you're, 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 you're a uh, cosmetic chemist. <laughs> Uh, and yet you have a website which, you know, uh, I would encourage everybody to go check out um, immortaltt.com. Um, I'll, I'll put it in the chat here so you can get a get a view, but it looks great, aesthetically great. Um, and you you did it yourself. So can you tell us a little bit about your experience in build, getting going with your storefront? So um, as you said, I've done um, pretty much, I manage pretty much the entire uh, process of the website. Um, it's myself, except for the photography of the product. I update it, I load it, I put the product on, I manage the inventory. Um, on my website, payments are processed using Stripe, and then I fulfill the orders myself usually as well. Um, so I have, I use my, um, I use Squarespace as a platform to build the website, and it's very, very intuitive and very user friendly. And I just started um, using it in 2014. And as I needed more and more um, options, functions, features, I have upgraded the website bit by bit over time. Um, I believe right now I pay for the US to be, to be um, the hosting and the management of the website, including the e-commerce um, a month. And um, the platform itself is generally very easy to use so that a person who has very little experience in this can still manage it. Um, and particularly Squarespace, they have a very strong focus in design. So the websites come out very clean and beautiful, kind of automatically as well, once the photography and the product images are great. Got it, great. Um, and then I see a bunch of questions around PayPal and comments about PayPal and, you know, you know, et cetera. And Carolyn, I know that, you know, in, in your journey, you've enabled using to checkout and PayPal and so on. So can you talk a little bit about that and what are, the, what are some of the pros, but also some of the limitations in terms of, you know, what audiences can accept it and what, audience, what audiences can't? So um, when we first started out, we used to check out for, for everything, for managing the, um, the, the magazine subscriptions, as well as for the book orders and, and single issues for the magazines. Um, initially, that was fine, because uh, it allowed, it, it creates a kind of um, checkout experience, a kind of shopping cart experience. So we didn't have to build that out on the, on the front end. It was kind of um, on, on their site. It would take you extremely to their site. And what's useful about to check out is that they then route the money back to, um, to your bank in Trinidad, um, which a lot of service providers do. Uh, we then started to experiment with PayPal because PayPal allows you to manage recurring subscriptions. So it seems it seemed kind of perfect and it had a kind of drop down menu so people could, could choose, you know, if they're in Trinidad or, or the Caribbean or 
North America or Europe or somewhere else, which is how we break down our um, subscription prices. And um, so that that generally uh, works well. My discomfort with both to checkout and PayPal is they're both overseas companies, and um, so the commission that you pay to them, um, which which varies depending on on the kind of transaction, is that you know so that you're, you're basically remitting not that. that foreign exchange overseas, which is not something I'm particularly comfortable with. But at the time that we started in 2006 or so, there weren't there were really very many options. Um, and the difficulty with PayPal as well is that you can't connect your bank account. So the best that you can hope for is that they basically remit the payment to your credit card. So it's like a credit on your credit card. Um, so we use that, so, you know, and paying overseas con contributors and things like that. But it's not it's not optimal. But the volume of our sort of subscriptions and stuff makes it so that that's not a huge deal for us. The disadvantage of well, as well of those two options is that credit card penetration in Trinidad and in the Caribbean is not the same as it might be in other parts of the world, so that people who don't have credit cards are limited. They, they can't, they basically can't use the facilities. So they're, and, and if people don't have bank accounts, which some people don't have in Trinidad and, and the Caribbean as well, they want to be able. Um, that then they're also sort of excluded from being able to use those platforms. So we're at the point now, as well, partly prompted by COVID as well, um, of expanding the e-commerce e side to include um, not just B2C transactions, transactions you know, business to, to, to um, you know, like our audience, but also to our, um, our business customers, so people who we do, you know, newsletters or corporate reports. So that they go or our advertising clients, so they can actually pay their bills. We can invoice and and they can pay their bills online. So we're kind of now exploring integrating all of the different um, e-commerce that we offer to all the different audiences and, and stakeholders, um, and trying to bring that business um, back into Trinidad so that we're not losing um, the foreign exchange by remitting the commission to the sea. Okay, great. And I'm gonna, so, I'm so Chica, gonna, if I if I could yeah. jump in there a yeah, sec. Please. Because um, I'm seeing the questions about mm -hmm. the different forms of payments and what happens there. Um, uh, over a year ago, the four local banks, of course, recognizing what was going, to, what was happening in building the e-commerce and so on, um, and in just to maintain the, the local transaction flows, uh, we had come together and there was the decision to. Um, to create this visa debit, visa debit cards, right? And what the intention from what I understand from all the, from the banks one. is to allow e-commerce on that platform. So you would have seen Scotia would have launched their platform already. FC is in, FC's, I think is about to go in pilot. Republic is in pilot, is, is going to be in pilot in June. So that, I mean, we have probably the largest volume of card users there. And so you will see that the e-commerce will grow from that, you know, because you, as you pointed out, Carolyn, the, the credit card users are the ones who primarily use the e-commerce now. So when you grow to the debit side, all those persons out there with their bank debit cards will now be able to use and transact locally. Mm -hmm. Right. So, and actually, I want, and as, I, as I look at the chat and so on, I'm going to come to you in a second, Alex, because you also have a, a very good perspective on this as well. I want to make sure that people kind of get some of the different options in their, in their head. So, um, and so we're going to net it out and kind of, you know, line them up. And, and I'm seeing some questions about, um, you know, will we kind of summarize this? So, yeah, so we will put some things together as well for folks. Um, you know, so that along with the on-demand webinar that will go up after this is done, um, we'll share some resources and additional resources and things that folks can read and dive into that will summarize some of the other pieces that have been discussed. So, so you can all know that um, as you're out there. Um, but, but uh, Catherine, so there are a bunch of people who are asking questions about their, 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 their I guess their interest was peaked when you mentioned, you know, Squarespace and, um, and Stripe and the payments and so on. Can you just just to come back to that and just expand on it a little bit to make sure people kind of understand and seeing questions about so wait so how how do you get the, the processing and how does it come to you and that's so can you just expand on that a little bit to, to folks so yeah so i have to be super transparent about that i do not process my website through a local account um i 
obviously have a, a, the same limitations that everybody else does. And emotion account is really an option for me with the amount of traffic um, that comes through my website at this point in time. So um, I have accounts, back accounts in the US that I process my um, my website transaction through. So anything that's done through PayPal comes into my US account. Everything that's done through Stripe on my Squarespace platform does come through my US account. Got it. Okay, great. All right. So that's helpful. So then, so then Alex, let's let's turn to you because you you have you know the quintessential example uh, that you can talk about in two different areas. You've had the building out with developers and kind of going bigger in terms of going through your e-commerce experience. Um, and then you have an appreciation of the payments pieces. So I want to spend some time diving in with you on both of those two dimensions. So, so first, let's talk a little bit, even though there's a lot of interest in payments, let's talk a little bit about your experience with getting going, just sort of building out the e-commerce infrastructure. Because I know one of your core learning areas throughout this has been, you know, maybe don't go as big all at once and take it in bite sizes. So maybe we could start talking about that and then we'll get into the payment side. Sure, no problem. I mean, I think that, um, I mean, because we've had an established business, a department store, and we've got tens and tens of products, tens of thousands of products. I mean, one of the things that we wanted to do, and like most new people trying to get into the business, let's build a fancy new website and let's get as many items as possible. And let's ride this wave of online shopping. But one of the things that I think we didn't realize is that, you know, it's not, it's just, it's, it is one thing to have a nice, pretty website. But one of the, you have to start thinking through is that, that going into the e-commerce business, it means pivoting your business. It just doesn't mean to have a new stop storefront. It means that you need to start thinking through about the, all of the backend processes and how you can get your product to delivery the customer and to have the same customer experience. So we, from moving all of our goods online, you know, there were many moving parts. You know, the website, for example, became more complex than our inventory system. Um, our inventory accuracy became very difficult to sort to, to manage um, because now you've got two sets of different numbers which inventory is correct from a fulfillment standpoint you need to start thinking about you know is it it became more challenging to fulfill online and in store because if you have the website pointing to the same stock you can be selling goods on your shelf that has already been paid for from the online so some of the challenges that we had is that we, how do we separate that stock? Do you keep a separate stock, right? Or you have a built-in manual processes in place or other types of processes to be able to sort of bring, once an item is sold, you pull those things off the shelf right away. You know, from a marketing standpoint, you know, we had to move from traditional media to social media. So every area of the business has to be impacted, has been impacted. And many, and I'm just looking at some of the chats in terms of getting um, going on online, you know, I think what most people or most entrepreneurs need to think about is like, how do you start thinking about online as the channel? And how do you start thinking about fulfilling that online as the channel? As you know, it's just not, by the way, we'll have a WhatsApp, you know, a number. How do you build the processes in place so that you can deliver the same customer experience? Um, there's a lot of things that we can get into, um, but we probably don't have the time here to do it. But at the same time, uh, my advice would be to start thinking through from customer acquisition, from payments, from merchandising the store, to the backend processing, to the fulfillment, and the uh, inventory accuracy. If if you have inventory or if you're selling services, it might be a little bit different. But you need to start thinking through all the different processes. What we did is that we started all at once. And if you had a group of uh, a group of our staff that were very very competent and familiar with online shopping and you had another group had no idea, right? And they're just used to packing up a truck, sending it to the store. All of a sudden you have a, a lot of disconnection in the back office that the customers don't see. And at the end of the day will affect and impact your fulfillment and how you actually wow the customer. How can you deliver? It's not just, you're not just integrating um, an online shopping as just another channel. It has to be fully integrated. Because if your backend channels don't work, your backend processes don't work, all of a sudden, both storefronts, your or digital storefront and your physical storefront, don't start meshing. And then you'll start having customer experience issues and so on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So start off small. Start off one at a time. Think it through, right? Because it can be overwhelming. But once you think it through, 
and say, okay, if I can get a couple items on, how do I start from end to end? How am I going to fulfill and how am I going to service? Um, right. And, so, and then since your objective, which is, a, which is a thing that a lot of people are interested in, your objective was mostly for a local audience or a local business or a local bank account. Um, and then everyone who's saying, okay, if I want to get into e-commerce, I want to make sure that funds are showing up in my accounts today. So can you tell us from your experience, how, how, how does that part work for you? What are you using? How are you, you know, break, break it down for us. Sure. I mean, I think that, um, you know, I'm seeing a lot of the comments in the chats and I think it's, it's really interesting because when we first started and, and many of the small islands actually have the challenges that you don't have many different payment options. Right. But I think now is that when you have a when you have a bank like the public bank is uh, also very innovative and bringing out lots of different products, you now have different means of payment. So you have the credit card payments. You can work through your local bank. You've got now the switch, as Denise had said, moving to Visa debit. All of a sudden now, at least in Trinidad, you know, that represents more than 50% of the population. And then you've also got the unbanked, right? So people using WePay, right? And looking at other types of options to be able to, uh, to, be able to pay. You create a WePay account. It's a local account. Um, obviously, WePay is, I think, I believe is also going regionally. So our viewers um, in some of the smaller islands will soon have access to that. Um, but what you're looking at, at now is that you want to be able to take payment any way how people want to pay. And a lot of the banks, local banks, as well as the regional banks, and Republic Bank is also a regional bank, you have now those facilities to be able to allow local payments to have it. And it wouldn't have to pass through a U.S. account and then you're on a Visa card as PayPal, PayPal does, or what have you use our local options and then what will happen is that you can get your payment process within a, if i believe denise you can get me um uh, within within a 24-hour period correct right so so that's main important for most businesses how am i going to get paid um now you have so many options of how to get paid even your wireless links terminals right or maybe not links in uh, uh, other countries but you know your debits and credit card terminals right how do you integrate that there are many different forms of payment Right, that can get into your account right away, and you have access to those funds right away. Okay, so it's all gonna, I'm going to I'm going to Denise, I'm going to bring you in so we so we make sure that everybody gets clear. Okay, so I'm a business. I have a business bank account, presumably. Okay, so that so that's good. I I use that. I'm transacting. That's my normal scenario. Now I'm trying to go into the e-commerce space. So so Alex, as you said, you said one, and we talked about it a little bit earlier on. One of the things that becomes important is okay, well, like, how do I open up if I'm going to go into e-commerce? How do I open up as many different avenues as possible? Because I have credit card customers, I have debit card customers, I have some customers who might want a different option. So, to, so what you said there was so from a from a receiving payment standpoint, there are there are now increasingly options for all. Your, yeah. your typical e-commerce to you know, merchant account through the bank, sort of the, the solution that Denise has talked about, and we'll, we'll bring you in, Denise, again there to, to flesh this out, um, can enable the credit card piece. And as the as we get into Visa debit card, that actually opens up more opportunities to receive payments from more, more customers. Okay, so we have that. And then we also have solutions like WePay, and WePay does allow you to pay with a credit card as well, but what they're also um, potentially trying to tackle is that just like we like our top up and so on in, in the Caribbean, where we are very accustomed to that for the mobile phone, they're also hoping to be able to, to, to give away for people who may not have a credit card to be able to pay. So if you as a business um, leverage each of these, you can, you can increase the surface area of how you receive payments from as many people as possible. Anything? Right. Like so, uh, um, before we actually start getting into the payment option or all the payment options, I think it comes back down to like what I was saying before. You need to start off small. Don't try and do all of it all at the same time. You need to look at your business and figure out where's your target audience, right? And are, is your target audience more on the credit card side or is your target audience, audience more on the debit side? From there, I think that's what you can start doing is then narrow it down and say, let me start with, if it's more on the debit, well, let me try the visa or the links or the 
debit and credit machine. So if it's on the unbanked, you know, maybe you can try on the WePay side of things. I think that it's important for people to understand, and again, not to bite off too much that they can chew, pick and choose which payment option. Make that work. And then either if you want to start getting back into, if you want to start going into the credit card side, you know, then obviously you would, you would then you speak to your local bank um, and then they would be able to start building in a plugin or connect your, um, your website to take online processing. So it really depends. Don't yeah. cast your head if the options are available, but I would start with where's my target audience, start with that first, get that process right, make sure you can deliver on your promises, and then start casting your white net a little wider and a little wider. Got it. And yeah, I, I, I quite agree with, with Alex. If I could jump in there, GK. Sure. Um, we really need to look and see where our customers are. What types of customers do we have? Uh, who do we want to attract? Where do we attract them? Where, do, are, they, where are these customers? How can we reach out to them? Um, and I think somebody had asked um, about the, the payments and align to that if we, they can use social media. Yes, the facilities are there for these payment buttons to work on Facebook, via WhatsApp, Insta, uh, many different platforms. But you, you have to reach the customers where they are. And as a, as a first, well, one of your steps, yes, you have to work on the back end stuff and the logistics and so on. But it's, it's, it's not quite true, build it and they will come. You can build it. But you, but you need to pull them in as well, right? Or go where they are, and and, right. and that's a key part of it. Yeah. So one of the questions I see, that I don't want to, you know, since I have a name that people um, can 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 do creative things with, I don't want to butcher this name, but uh, Melak or Melak. Um, I'm not sure how how many people have this question, but I see one person who's, who seems really interested in. Well, why is it not possible to to just build a site uh, or, or e-commerce presence and get money straight to my account. He, he is most interested in why, why does he have to go through third parties? Um, you know, is there a way to completely avoid third parties? So, so can you shed any light on, on you know, on, on why, what, what's, what are some of the reasons that we're talking about, you know, gateways and um, you know, PayPal and others? Uh, why, why is it that that's not possible? Uh, um, but you do need a mechanism because, uh, mm -hmm. of course, it's moving funds from one place to the next. So how do you do that? I mean, if it's a physical, if it's a physical channel, I mean, cash may work. But if you're talking about an online channel, you do need some mechanism for the cash for the for the funds to move, and um, and that's where these third parties come in, and. I mean, I don't know if the concern is with foreign third parties or just generally third parties, but you're... it seems to be third parties in in general. The, okay. The, the, it seems that seems to be the question. It doesn't seem to want to have to pay a commission to a third party on any funds received for uh, for an e-commerce transaction. Yeah, I, I think if if I can add to what Denise is saying, I think at the end of the day, you need to have a secure channel to be able to transfer funds from one place to the next, whether that be on a credit card, whether that be a links machine, or even you have a, a, a direct bank to bank transfer, at the end of the day, you're still using a third party mechanism, unless you build your own sites and you build your own payment gateway, right? I mean, there are other options that are available, for example, with Wild DC in Asia, where they're using different types of um, digital currency to pay, but at the end of the day, it is still a platform to pay. Otherwise, it really isn't an e-commerce platform. What you're doing, if I mean, the only other way to be able to exchange ca uh, to exchange money, if not not through a secure method, is actually showing up with your own hand in cash, which in effect is an ordering system, right? An e-commerce platform effectively takes payment and is more interactive, but a payment solution is, is, is in integral to that. It is a digital form of business, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. But, you know, if you want to get into the e-commerce space where you can get money right away, you have to use an established platform, right? So far, that I mean, that's what we have existing, but it's also, it's a, from a security standpoint, you want to make sure that you can have those funds in your account and have access to those funds right away. And and as of right now, you know, these through these third parties, whether it be primarily through the bank right now, is 
one of the safest ways to be able to get your funds and have access to your funds within a 24-hour period. Great. Yeah. And, and, and as well, of course, they do bring value. I mean, there's a, in a regulated financial economy as ours, obviously there are regulatory requirements that have to be met. And these third parties would have invested in tools that w and that delivered those regulations, ensure that they that yes, as Alex said, it's stable, but it meets all the requirements of the different central banks, FIUs, other regulatory. So, so that's the value that they bring, you know, in bundling that together for you. Got it. Great. And so, Denise, the same way that we're trying to help people really get crystallized around, you know, the different payment options. I want to help people get really crystallized around. Um, what Republic Bank can do, because I see lots of questions about what, how, how do I leverage Republic Bank specifically. Um, and as you talk about it, it would be great if you, if you can expand to, you know, we have a lot of folks from, from outside, from all around the region. Um, and so I'm seeing lots of interest in, okay, well, how does, you know, how does it work for, for St. Vincent and we can't do PayPal or this or that or what have you. So, so as, you, as you talk through, if you could kind of expand to, to, you know, because there may be some differences or nuances, you could just kind of highlight what those are as well. Across the territory. So we uh, we offer the ePay service right now in Trinidad. I know we have the e-commerce and pilot in Barbados and um, is working on it in Suriname. In the former Scotia territories, which are all Arabic territories, they do have, we haven't migrated those facilities over, but the, it is available, e commerce um, is available there as well. And uh, um, as we consolidate those platforms, we bring in all our services into those areas. Got it. Okay, great. So, can you expand then a little bit? So, you said Republic EP. And, and we'll connect it to the larger question, because what, what, what is in many people's minds, you know, 57% of people are interested in, okay, well, how do I actually get paid from this thing? So let's just, again, make sure that the folks get it clear. I have a business account. I come to my bank. I come to Republic, and I say, okay, great. Help. I, I, I'm going to go get a developer. You can give me a button. I want to accept digital transactions. Can okay, tell us a little bit more about what they get at that point and how it how it connects up, just to make sure everybody is very clear. Right. So the, the registration process is, is pretty painless. Um, you have to have your company registered. So you have to show that the business is incorporated and give a listing for your directors and secretaries and some ID information for those persons. Um, you don't have to provide five years of financial statements or anything like that. Um, so the, the sign up is pretty quick and it's even quicker if you're an existing merchant with us. If you already have a point of sale merchant, it's even faster. But even so, the process can happen within four days for you to be able to do the simple setups with the payment buttons and so on. Um, you don't have to have a bank account with Republic Bank. Um, so, but if you do have a bank account with us, it means that you get the same day payment. So as you transact um, you, uh, online, and customers pay you, it will settle, we will settle those transactions and you will get payment within 24 hours. If you work with another bank, if your bank account is with someone, when we need an additional 24 hours, 20, well, business days for those for, to be moved to the other bank. Great. Okay. I hope that okay. It so that, okay. So that, so that connects that part. So, so with, with a solution like EPA, I can have a, if I have a Republic Bank account that, that opens up same day, I can still come with another account and you're going to, to, to enable me. So now I need to go build a website or you talked a little bit earlier, but I know some people missed it. Some people came in afterwards. So if people are interested in, or, yeah, does it mean that there's APIs that I go get? So let's say I go get, you know, an ad agency or a company or what you got to build me an e-commerce site. Um, how does that site connect up now with your solution so that the, I click shop, I click order, I put in my credit card info and it gets to me. Can you just help make sure that we just we'll make sure everybody's very crystal clear? Right. So from the consumer side, it I mean, it's, it's very easy because that's the whole point to focus on the customer experience and make sure the, they have a positive experience and want to come back. It's easy and simple. Um, from the merchant side, if you have an existing website that you want to use and incorporate, then um, you, it might be easier for you to use one of our plugins. Um, so 
that is uh, uh, buttons that you will have on your side that will link you through to our payment systems. Um, but as I said, you know, not everyone has a website or wants to go through building their own website. They might be interested in have and participating in a more group website, uh, mm -hmm. like a mobile, or they might not even want to go that far. As I said, they might want to just have invoicing and payment buttons that they can use and send someone via WhatsApp. Say, here's the invoice. They click on the button that they get in WhatsApp and they uh, put in their payment and it will uh, open up and they'll be able to put in their payment information, submit it. And that has a unique link that will tie it back into the the channel, the payment channel, and we and, and lets us know, okay, this amount was authorized um, to this merchant, and then we can take that and process the payment into your bank account. Yeah? Got it. Okay, great. And you said that that the the time horizon from checkout to receipt of funds is a day or less. Right. So for the for if you bank have a bank account with Republic Bank, once the the, the, the transaction is, is comes into us and is settled, we can do that within twenty four hours. But if the if you if you choose to um, have the account linked to a, an account in another bank, meaning that we have to credit whatever funds you get from your customers to this other bank. It will be an additional, most likely two days, because it's going through the ACH channels to get there. Got it. And is this for local currency and U.S. currency, or, or are there restrictions there? Th these are, are TT dollar transactions. Okay. Got it. Okay, great. All right. So, I have one question yeah, there. Sure. Mm -hmm. If you have, if I, like, for example, we are in the process of going through setting up a, um, a merchant account and stuff like that with with Republic Bank. So we're kind of going through this with, with a lot of other small businesses. And one, we have a, a US bank account for, for foreign, transa um, foreign transactions with foreign clients and then the TT bank account. So can the payment gateway receive funds in US and, or, or foreign currencies and in TT and then remit to the appropriate bank account? Well, we don't have a mechanism for remitting to non-local bank accounts. At this point so in time, a local you uh, like Republic Bank US dollar account. So, can it receive funds in US and then directly mm -hmm. go into that account? I'm not sure. I don't think so, but I can I can clarify that. Okay. okay. I, I just had one other question. I saw somebody ask, which was um, what the, the plugins that you mentioned mm -hmm. are they for all sort of web platforms like WordPress, Drupal, that kind of thing, or yeah, yes, yeah. That, that's what. Yeah. Yeah. And if you need assistance, and if you need assistance, we can certainly put you on to um, developers who can support you in, in doing that. Yeah. Great. Great. Thank you. Good. So I actually want to then take it back, take it back up or not. So we kind of went a little deep there, but we know that there's a lot of interest in payments. We also know there are a lot of questions around, you know, local markets, etc. I think um, to me, just you could just maybe answer one of the questions in terms of length of time from. Hey, I come and I knock on the door and I'm saying, hey, I want EP to being done and ready to go as the, as the business. What's that time horizon typically um, overall? Right. So obviously it, it depends on what the customer wants, right? You know, um, how, what do you want to develop? How far do you want to go? But for the simplest um, implementation with the quick invoicing and payment buttons, that would be four days. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Great. Um, great. Okay, good. So, so good. So we've gone a little bit deep on, on payments. I want to kind of come back up now. Let's come back from a thousand feet or 5,000 feet and let's come back up to 10,000 feet a little bit. Um, because there is this, there is this area around building out your site, right? Um, and we kind of flew over it a little bit, but what you have is you have, um, you know, Catherine talked about kind of getting in there quickly and sort of adapting and building and kind of thinking about, um, aesthetics and balance and ease of use. Alex has gone much further down the, the thing, multiple developers, etc. So you you could use some of the buttons and the plugins and so on. You understand that deeply. And Carolyn, you're kind of in between. You've done some of the self-serve stuff, um, you know, but you've integrated on your own with with other with other foreign providers. So can we talk a little bit about you know pitfalls to avoid? for people as they seek to build their 
e-commerce presence if they're getting started, right? So, Carla, let's start with you in terms of things that you've learned. Um, you know, that's, that's, that's fairly unfamiliar for, for, for a lot of people. Can you talk about some of the things that you've seen there? Hmm. Um, I think one of the things to get really clear on really early on is um, who your customers are, if it's possible, because I know we're not, we're not a society or a, or a region that, or at least from the island to be um, very data rich, so sometimes we don't always have clear profiles of who your customer is. But if we can get clear on that and understand, you know, as Alex was kind of mentioning, are they more on the credit card side or the debit card side? Are they, um, do they not have bank accounts altogether? Um, and try to cater for all of those. That is really helpful, um, even if you do it incrementally. Uh, the other thing is to, to be very clear about exactly what you as a business need, like, and to have clear expectations and understanding of how the payment processing works and where the money goes to and what your transaction fees are. Because you have to kind of do the math and figure out is this is this a particular is this payment provider or processor um, a, a worthwhile partner or is it going to take too much off the top? And then uh, you know you have to kind of kind of calibrate your approach to that. So I think having kind of clear expectations of what your customer wants and needs and also a clear understanding of what you need and how you access the money is really important. Um, one thing that's interesting for, for us, for example, is that even though we're trying to create a payment gateway for um, invoicing so that our clients can, can actually pay online, a lot of them actually still prefer to do bank transfers and checks. So even though we're kind of looking at investing in that, it may not actually be worthwhile for us in the short term because it might be too few people that actually want to follow that particular um that take that they want to take it up so again it comes back to kind of knowing what your customer wants and needs and what they feel comfortable with and kind of um operating the food. great um and and alex let's kind of come to you because you you've gone you know way down the way down the rabbit hole as far as the build out so you've shared a lot about you know taking steps but sometimes it might feel like to get to build that website you kind of have to do it all so what, what what would you share in terms of you know tips and tricks to to get going with a website if you have to go if you if you have a larger amount of inventory or larger set of products and services and you, you do need to engage developers and you do need to go a little bit further what have you learned and seen well i think one of the biggest things is uh, it's uh, there's a lot of hidden costs uh, as to getting online if you try to go all out right i mean i think that's what we've tried to do at the beginning and recognizing that if you if you're trying to get started right and so i, I know i'm coming back to the same thing the same point but at the end of the day is that you need to be able to figure out as in, in terms of getting started is to figure out that uh, or avoid the concept that going digital is everything because because when you go digital and you try to add greater functionality to your website or what have you, all of a sudden you start adding a lot more website development costs. You start looking at how do you integrate your inventory systems. Um, you start looking at um, your customer acquisition and your logistics and your packaging and so on. So, so I think that in terms of you know advice, in terms of uh, uh, getting started, in terms of development and so on, is figure out which part of your process do you want to digitize. Do you first want to start off with the front end, whether it be a Facebook or whether it be an actual website, and then scale that. Figure out, figure out through the process. What processes do you can you want to be automated through the website, through payments and that sort of thing? And maybe you keep your um, you keep your fulfillment manual at that point in time. Um, if you if you're recognizing that you only have ten items, or you need to go to three or four hundred items. Um, you're not looking into uh, getting a much larger amount of uh, uh, um, investment in terms of developers and so on. So, I mean, I, I know I, I may have strayed a little bit directly from the question and so on, but I think one of the key things to focus on is um, pitfalls, as you say, coming back to your original question, is to think about what are the hidden costs that are part that that can that can come out of this, right? And I think the, one of the major hidden costs and something that we've learned before is don't try to scale too quickly, right? Mm -hmm. Because all of a sudden, because if you, for example, if you look at packaging, right? If you want to start scaling really big and put three, four hundred or thousands of products on, all of a sudden now you're investing in packaging 
right, and tape and, and labels and that sort of thing that you may not necessarily need right out to the gate, right? Whether, and then secondly, um, allocation of inventory. You know, how much of your inventory do you want to put online? Because if you start selling the things online and then you sell it in your store as well, all of a sudden, that good that has been paid for already through the online site disappears. So, um, so I think one of the major hidden costs that I think a lot of people need to realize is the hidden cost of reputational risk. If you are unable to satisfy the customer, if you're now getting started, right, and you want to be able to do all these great things, think about how it's going to impact your ability to service that customer. Because if you are unable to service the customer and you're getting too technical and too, too many platforms and integration and so on, all of a sudden that cost to you will be greater because then I will just go to somebody else who's actually the customer service is better, you know, the process, the delivery is better, invoicing and payment, whatever it is and so on, everything through the process um, is it, it, better. So your reputational risk is per perhaps one of the largest hidden costs that you need to consider in terms of getting online. Which right. parts do you want to digitize and what, what can you do well at? Okay. Main things. And, and, and Catherine, I want to kind of come to you for a different perspective because you know, I can tell that from listening to the or looking at the, the chat comments and questions coming in, we have people on, as, as we knew, and that's kind of why we put together a, a group like this, we have people are, are all along the spectrum. We've seen questions from people who are like, I have nothing, I have no, no five years of history, no bank, I'm like literally just getting going and all the way, all the way up to the other end. And so for, for those small businesses who, um, who want to uh, come back to your kind of you know, key learning that, hey, like, this is not something that is big and unachievable, right? Um, you've been able to get in, you said you do the logistics and fulfillment and so on yourself. So can you talk a little bit, you know, and maybe not as many people who are, people who are more interested in payments and more interested in the experience and getting over the website, I want you to talk a little bit about the delivery of your products and services um, and how you've managed to do that. You get an order from somewhere, you know, um, and you have to go ship to them. How, how have you approached that to, to manage those, those things? Well, that's interesting because with the original pitfall question, that's the type of, that's the type of response I wanted to come with. Because um, yes, we have a lot of focus on the payments right now in the comments and in the conversation, but there are so many other areas within this um funnel that build trust within the e-commerce like pipeline that build trust not just the accept ex acceptance of the payment because i can talk about a bunch of websites that i see that will gladly take my money accept the payment perfectly well um and that that look completely shady that i may never receive that product from um or that may not have any sort of any sort of system set up to fulfill the products correctly to me. Um, locally, I uh, we have some wonderful services that I, I utilize. Um, the CC Post Courier is my main go-to. Um, I know a lot of people, sometimes when I tell customers that I fulfill the CC Post, they get a little concerned um, because they're familiar with the regular mail, but the courier service um, is extremely efficient. It's a generally a two-day service and there is package tracking and um, you can prepay and pre purchase your, um, your flat rate bags or your parcel tickets and then right. drop off the package um, to people and, they, and during COVID-19 they've actually been really supportive um, of me. Um, during this time, helping me get packages out. I also use DHL for international fulfillment. Um, they have you know, a small business platform, so I do get um, some discounted rates. So that's conversations that you can have with them about what your needs are as a small business. Um, thankfully, um, well, right now my international tools are still quite small, um, and my international rates are still relatively high, especially when you compare to what I pay locally um but i'm managing it um and i can get my packages to my international customers within a few days people are very sometimes very surprised at how quick they can receive them from knowing that they're coming from some of that got it so so yeah that, that and there's a straight point that you made here because um 
you know, there certainly is, as you said, getting going. Um, there's a bunch of things that, that, that businesses need to think about. There's, a, there's certainly a lot of interest in, in the payments and obviously for, for good reason, making sure that you can get paid. Um, so for those who haven't seen, we did post in the chat um, an email alias. I think there, are, there are some questions that are very, very specific to, you know, the receiving of payments, the specifics of the Republic Bank solutions, um, where they work, where they don't work, etc. So just calling attention and I will post it again that, uh, that you can, uh, if you have a very specific question, in addition to checking out the website and so on, um, you can send an email to smebusiness at rfhl.com um, to, to get very specific product and service questions answered, time horizons, etc., etc., etc. So so the SME business team will be happy to, to go deeper with you. But then I also want to make sure that um, the point that, that you made, Catherine, and, and that, that we've talked through as well, is that getting going with e-commerce is not just about being able to receive a dollar from somebody. Um, uh, you can have an amazing site and all the capabilities to receive dollars from people and a poor customer experience long delivery times and then you end up in in, in a different set of channels uh, challenges you can have great experience ability to receive payments from everybody and have a really hard time getting people to your storefront um and and so really it's important that people think across the entire spectrum we're going to come back to you denise on that because that is a, that is an area that we talked about um you you feed in uh with me on on the, the acquisition of customers and getting customers to your storefront is a really important area that people need to be able to think about and spend time as you look across customers, the ones who've gotten going fastest, were able to either bring their existing customer bases to their e-commerce store, et cetera. Can you talk a little bit about you know, some of the best practices that you've seen there? Yeah, and it's really about knowing your customer, right? Knowing your customer base. And as I said, knowing where are they on Facebook? Are they WhatsApp persons? Um, or are they, because of the nature of the business, are they in some geographic area where you need to do a different type of marketing and outreach to those persons? Um, or is, is your business aligned to certain types of activities? And once you know where they are, you can market to those persons to bring them to your site, right? So there are all different ways, and of course, the online marketing, if you know your, your customers uh, are on social media a lot, you have to choose those places as well to promote. And I know that, um, you know, going online for the first time, it could be a little daunting. Um, and when persons start to talk a lot of tech stuff and they talk, start talk about search engine optimization and all these fancy words and it can be daunting, and um, I know you shared the link with the SME business, and we, we do want to help um, the SMEs embrace this and, um, I guess, dump down some of that anxiety by providing mm -hmm. information, you know, as to what you have to do to bring your business online. Um, and, uh, yeah, the, the acquiring customers and getting them to your site is, is is an important thing and there's a whole science about it but start small start small and i guess being able to reach out to your existing customers might be a good place to start right and and actually that that, that kind of connects because carolyn you you guys have been able to do that you've been able to 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 sell subscriptions to sell books to sell magazines etc um what what as we kind of start as we start winding down here um can you talk a little bit about your your best practices or all the pitfalls to avoid that you've seen in terms of getting people knowing that they can transact with you online and purchase from you online? How have you been able to achieve that? Well, I think we, we start with a leg up because I was thinking about um, you know the, the reputation of uh, trust and that sort of thing. And it, it is important that people find you and understand who you are, what you offer, and that you're reliable and consistent and um, trustworthy. We have an advantage with that because of the fact that, you know, our websites are built around content and e-commerce kind of complements the content that we provide because it's it's people that want to be able to buy the physical copies of the things that, that are actually on our website. And I think that, that if people can think through 
how can I kind of market my, my, my products and my services and think about a content strategy that helps in their marketing for us? That's a, a really useful way of actually attracting traffic to your site and driving e-commerce. And that's not just on your website, but your social media and how they complement each other. So how can you be helpful? How, how do you demonstrate your sort of thought leadership in, in your particular field? So if you have, um, you know, a, a jewelry store or something like that, then, you know, you talk about, about fashion and ways that you can sort of um, put together certain looks. And so, so you kind of get to know your audience, understand where they're thinking, what they need, and, and tailor content to that. Now, that can be something that sounds a little daunting, overwhelming for people who are more than just starting out and, and doing have sort of like all the, the, the content that we have online for, for magazines. But if you literally just sit down and think, okay, well, once a week, I'm going to think through something that I, some problem or question I know my customer has. And you try and build out the content and use things like, um, you know, Unsplash for, for imagery because it doesn't even cost you anything to do that. And you, you build a blog around it and they're free services like WordPress or, or um, I see some people use Wix a lot as well. So there are lots of ways to sort of like build content, build authority, build trust and, and help help that drive your, your e-commerce as well. Great. Um, and and, and you know, Catherine, I know you're kind of a, 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 a master of that in terms of creating content and um, using it and kind of using social media to bring people in, uh, draw them in, and then leverage that traffic and that audience to to kind of cross boats and, and drive sales. And that's been effective for you um, over the over the past years as, as you've been doing it, right? Yes, um, it's it's one of the very few options that are available to me because I'm not able to invest in um, high level marketing. So we use. Um, content strategy and to some extent digital marketing when when it's a high traffic time like late in the year towards Christmas. Um, so we do some programmatic advertising, but mostly my thrust is trying to build community um, using social media and just kind of leveling that up um, at every opportunity. So um, trying to start um, a blog as well, a beauty blog that kind of brings people to the website as well and. Um, trying to set myself up um, as a thought leader, as an expert in the area of beauty locally um, and drive people to the business and have people driven to the personal um, side of it as well. So that's Great. Great. Um, and Alex, I was going to touch touch on you here before we wrap. Um, again, different, different size and scale, but how do you you know, how, how is your sort of interpretation of if you build it doesn't necessarily mean that they will come? Um, how has that experience been for, for you at Excellent Stores? And what have you learned that other people at, at, of other business sizes can take from that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it, it really is just that. It is that if you build it, it may not necessarily come. And I think that, you know, going back to the question that, um, uh, that we were talking about earlier with Denise is that we have to go where there are, you know, your customers are at, where your target market is. Now, um, I do, I, Chiki, if you don't mind, I, I, I'm seeing a lot of comments back and forth, you know, saying that, you yeah. know, like small businesses get on one and, and excellent stores is not considered a small business and so on. And I want to address everyone's concerns, a couple of things. One, first and foremost, I think that the process to getting online is the same, whether it's a small business or a large business, right? I think that there are multiple platforms you don't necessarily need to build an e-commerce website. You need, um, <clears throat> you can do commerce, you can do digital co digital commerce through Facebook and social media, right? And then you have um, um, uh, a banking institutions like Republic Bank being able to allow payments through Facebook and WhatsApp and other types, other types of sort of digital, in, in the digital space, right? So at the end of the day, for when people are coming online, it's not just for big businesses, the process is the same. It's that you're just picking and choosing which part of the process, which tool you're going to use, whether you're going to use WhatsApp, whether you're going to use Facebook, whether you use Instagram or what have you. And then you can then decide and say, well, from a payment perspective, which payments platform are you then going to choose as well? So, and then um, there's one thing I want to um, address with our St. Lucia um, friends uh, who are listening in right now is that there's a lot of, lot of chats within the chat saying, you know, well, well great, this is a lot of stuff that's happening in Trinidad. But the one thing I would, I would like to sort of say is that we are also in St. Lucia as well, Excellent Stores is in St. Lucia. But what I have done with working with many of the banks there in St. Lucia is that what you see 
what's happening in Trinidad is actually a platform that w- will be soon rolled out and it always be, and it will shortly be rolled out in a lot of the places like the OACS. Mm-hmm. I'm looking forward to start doing online business within the OACS. Um, one of the challenges that we've had, you know, um, exporting or using online as a means to get across the globe or the, or the Caribbean is the fact that, you know, we don't have a Caribbean single market economy as of yet. Right? So therefore, if I ship goods in from Trinidad and then ship it out to St. Lucia, I still incur charges and duties and tax there in St. Lucia and Trinidad when I go out to St. Lucia. So coming back to the OACS, um, what it means to the OACS is that, is that I think that um, when you have regional companies uh, like Republic Bank that are using Trinidad as a test case to, to, to refine their processes, to look at all these all sorts of different options, it all of a sudden becomes easier to roll out in the OACS, in Barbados, uh, which is not in the OACS. Um, and, and I think it's important for people because it's not as scary as a lot of people may think. Yes, we've been around for a while, but the process is the same. It's which part of that process are you going to pick and choose to digitize, to go online? Go, start off small. If you're on Facebook, if you can only do WhatsApp at that point in time, and if you don't have a, a delivery network, Start off with your own car, right? You know, what point in that process, the process is still the same. Pick and right. choose and how well do you can service your customer. Great. Yeah, and I think that that's a, a, a good place to sort of net net this out. I think today, um, you know, we really wanted to explore the idea that, that there are a range of different areas if you're interested in getting going with e-commerce, um, which, we, which, which we see on screen. You have to think about acquiring customers to think about the experience, the storefront, what channels you're going to use, um, and, and why are you doing it in the first place? Is it for your local market? Is it to go uh, you know, regional? Is it to go global? Um, there's a lot, and there certainly is a lot to think about in terms of payments. Um, there are increasingly more and more options. Um, the Republic Bank has a number of options as well. Um, there, there are lots of precision questions around when is it available? Where would it, where where will it be available? So certainly we point um, folks if, if there are still more questions to SME Business at rfhl.com. Um, then there's a very important area um, uh, which is the merchandising, the, the the making sure that your products are easy to understand, um, and that people don't get overwhelmed and leave. So that's the online and site merchandising area. And then last but not but certainly not least. Uh, you know, if you're going to get going with e-commerce, there's also going to be an impact in terms of managing logistics, service delivery, etc. So across this spectrum, um, there are lots of different nuances and areas to get in, but it's not beyond anybody at any size to get in. But these are certainly the things that, you know, as I think you will have heard across today's conversation that are really important to, to, to pay attention to across all of these areas. Um, you know, as we've mentioned, today is the first in a series. So there are some, you know, additional, you know, in addition, additional resources that are uh, that are coming on stream. Um, you know, Republic SME Toolkit.com um, will be a place where there'll be lots more uh, kind of um, aggregation of information and content from other entrepreneurs and other founders and. Uh, you know, how-tos and other stories, again, more from the standpoint of building a more successful business. Um, and so that's a site that, that Republic Bank uh, has been building and is investing in. Um, there is a webinar, too, coming up, uh, which is going to be focused on succeeding in the low-touch economy in two weeks. So make sure that you check that out. You'll also get information about that in the follow-up email um, after this webinar. So there are lots of resources that are out there. So I want to kind of take a, a moment to, to just thank our, our, our panel. Um, you know, some people, as they came through, didn't know all the names and, and people. So again, um, to Denise Ramarain from uh, Republic Bank, who leads up electronic, electronic channels and payments. Uh, Alex Chong, who's the CEO of Excellent Stores. Um, Carolyn Taylor from Media and Editorial Projects. Uh, and Catherine Nurse um, of Immortal Beauty, uh, and I'm Chike Farrell from Caribbean Ideas Synapse. So it's been a pleasure. This webinar will be uh, available on demand 
Um, if you want to kind of go back in and, and refer to different things, we will also create a little bit of a resource package as well. So all of these things will be made available. So check your email uh, for for access to those links uh, thereafter. So uh, still 400, over 400 people online on the webinar. So thank you for taking the time out to, to spend some time with us um, today. And we look forward to seeing you on the next webinar. So thanks to the panel and, and thanks to all of the audience again. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, guys. Thank you.